I look forward to this moment. I've been praying about this, this day because I feel that Biola uh, is ripe and a lot of you are ready to really change the world and uh, to see Orange County fall in love with Jesus. I studied the history of Biola uh, this past weekend and found out that the early stages of the development of this, this university, that they actually put a sign on top that said, Jesus saves. And this university was founded upon the recognition that Jesus saves the world. And I know that you're gonna be called to be a part of that movement of God. So it's my honor to be with you today. I'm praying that God will speak to you. I feel my main role this morning is actually to pray for you. And so uh, at the end of the time together, it'd be my honor just to pray and that you receive and sense the favor of God on your lives to do his bidding wherever he may call you. So just for a moment, let's pray and then I'll pray for us at the end as well. Father, right now we ask that you would come and speak to us, that we hear your voice, that you'd encounter us. Lord, whether we're introverts or extroverts, wherever we may be on the spectrum of personality, God, you see us, you know us. So we ask that your Holy Spirit would fill this room, that you'd you'd allow us to see you present, that you'd encounter us in a way that break up our routine, that disrupt our universe, so that we'd be fully awakened to your power and to your strength. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Now, one of the things I heard was that Biola was really a a student body that was observant, that you had these skills of observation. So I brought a little video to test that out to see how observant you may be. Uh, Some of you may have seen it, but what I want you to check out really closely is there's gonna be some guys in white, and I want you to see how many times they actually pass the ball, but really try to pay attention and note what's going on. Check this out. Hey, that's actually a scientific phenomenon. That's called inattentional blindness. How many of you actually saw the dancing bear the first time around? Okay, there's a, some, some of you did. Some of you probably seen it before. That's why. But this is called inattentional blindness, and what, it, what happens is, and I ride a motorcycle, so I know this, on Interstate 5 or when I'm a 405, people can be looking at you, but they actually don't see you. I mean, they see you with their eyes, but the brain's not registering it. Literally, it's called inattentional blindness. You don't mean to, but you're looking at a person, but it's not registering because it's not your normal frame of reference. Do you recognize that this can actually happen in regards to our relationship with God? That you can be so routine with your knowledge of who God is and with the language or nomenclature that's around you and with the forms of religion that you've embodied and embraced that it's often easy to miss miss the power of the Spirit and of who God is in your life. So what I wanna talk about today is what really are we supposed to be about when it comes to God? Because maybe if we miss God, we can miss his purposes in our life. I wanna share with you what I think something that you're thinking about right now, and and that's your destiny. What are you called to do while you're living on this planet? You know, if you're to think about a mission, you know, you could be artists, you can be business leaders, pastors, whatever. But if you think of a major macro vision that we're called to as followers of Jesus, what does that really look like? This is what we normally do. We say, you know what, we gotta be successful. So what we're gonna do, and this is our natural tendency, is we're gonna build a big box. This could be your job someday. This is gonna be the place that you say, this is where I'm gonna root, and I'm gonna make a difference with my life. You know what I call this? It's really easy to happen. I call this Genesis 11. And this is kind of the the Babel thinking. And Genesis 11 was about a group of homogeneous people. They all came together, they're different, but they came together to build this one building. They went to find out how great they are. And they wanted other people to know how great they are. But there's a little dilemma with this. What's the problem? Well, the problem is Genesis chapter one, verse 28. Check it out. Here's the world, and here's the buildings that we often do that we want to build, but we're actually called, in Genesis 1.28, to roam the whole earth. You see, we're going to want to stay in a box, but Genesis 1.28 says to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and actually govern it or subdue it. So your design that you're called to live is actually to roam the whole earth. Say with me, Rome. Rome. 
Yeah, you're called to roam it. Now, what does that actually look like to roam the whole earth like Genesis has called you? Not to do just the box thing, but also to roam the whole earth. What does that look like? Well, if you essentially narrow it down to two main nuances of thought, you could probably say it refers to freedom and to filling, okay? Freedom and filling. In other words, you were called as you roam the earth to feel totally free. But what happens as you grow older as a Christian, you feel like you're more in a box. And you're gonna have to join a box or an organization someday, and then your life seems to wither away, and you look at your parents and you say, I don't wanna live that type of crappy life. Why would I wanna live that life? Yeah, they got some money, and they got some really cool things going on, but you know what? I wanna be more free. So God has actually called you to live a free life. And this is something that was new to me that was an epiphany recently. I always thought freedom was just to live outside the box, but sometimes God actually calls you, not that the box is this intrinsically good by itself, but he calls you sometimes to go inside a box, an organization, or into a painful process or season of your life. And what's supposed to happen while you're in the box? Well, a lot of times we just complain and we get critical. We get nasty, we get mean with people. We got a chip on our shoulder because we don't want to be in the box. It's been too long and too hard. But may I remind you of like Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela was in Robbins Island and he was imprisoned in this small cell. And what he did is he turned that small cell and that prison yard into what's known today as Robbins University. There he taught poetry, he taught Shakespeare, he went through the, uh, the different academic uh, professors and minds of the day, and he read history to the prisoners. You see, freedom is not just about a structure, it's about a state of mind. You can be in a box, but you can be totally free. You are called for freedom. You were designed for it. You're called to go inside boxes or go outside boxes. You're called to roam the earth. The other aspect of this is you're called to fill the earth from Genesis 1.28. This filling has a unique idea. If you study this in the Hebrew, it has this idea of multiplication. You're called to have lots of children. But I think it's more than that. I think this filling actually has this idea of the presence of God. In fact, as you look at the New Testament, it has this really cool word called pleroma. And I like it, it says fullness of God. And so the other, this picture of this is wherever you walk, you are like the fullness of God. So you walk into a business, you walk into your neighborhood, you're bringing the fullness of God. It's similar to what I saw in uh, Daniel chapter one and two, and you see these amazing young men. And these guys are talented, they're academics, they're the brightest of their day. And they're lifted to this high career by the king. But the unique thing about them wasn't actually their intelligence. The Bible says that the unique thing about them was their extraordinary spirit. And many of you have that right now. It may be untapped and you see it sparking once, once in a while, but do you know as a follower of Jesus, you have that extraordinary spirit. It's in you. Man, it's rising up. And when you fill a room, people will notice it. You don't even have to say Jesus. But the beauty that's unleashed from you through the Holy Spirit as you enter that place is that extraordinary spirit. Now I think about my son, uh, uh, Luke. And my my boy, like he was at Northwood High School down south here. He played football. He played different uh, stuff at his private school that he later went to. He's now like on an island in Kona. You know, he's working with some students there called YWAM. He's hanging out there. And this this guy, man, when he was in in, in school, I didn't realize how much he was involved in different stuff that I didn't know about. I knew he liked to party, but he really liked to party. You know, he got involved in the pharmaceutical industry, I guess, you know, a little bit. And so, and so as he did get involved in the pharmaceutical industry, you know, his life started to kind of go apart. But then he went to this place in Kona, and his life started changing. And I'll never forget the day he calls me up and he's in Nepal. This is cool, he's 18 years old, he got, got to go to Nepal. He says, Dad, hey, can you pray for me? I go, yeah, what? And he goes, uh, can you pray that, you know, there's blind people out here, that when I touch them and pray for them, would you pray that they get healed, that they can see? I go, uh, yeah. And he says, and Dad, you know, they, they actually burn people's bodies here a lot. They even take, a, they, they, have, they have these live human sacrifices of children 
and there's these dead bodies all over the place on the outskirts of the village, uh, you know, it'd be great, Dad, because these people could figure out G who Jesus is if they see maybe a dead person come alive. Would you pray that uh, maybe if we pray for them that they would be resurrected? Uh, yeah. And you gotta know my background, man. I, all this stuff was kind of kooky, spooky stuff for me because I, I came from a really you know, conservative background. So he's asking me to say this, and I'm saying, yeah, because I believe in the power of God, but I'm not sure. But I started praying, I said, God, would you touch my son? I said, would you make him so alive that the wild stuff he thought you know, he did in high school was nothing compared to what he's gonna experience now? I go, man, there's a wildness you can touch on from the world side, but you get to know the wild heart of God, watch out. <laughs> I mean, it's done. Your life's over. Because you met Jesus, man. It's like, who could ride the back of Aslan but you? So I'm thinking about this, I'm going, okay, yeah, I know there's my theology and I know this other stuff, okay, but I'm gonna pray. My son calls me like two weeks later, dad, you're not gonna believe this. I go, what? Because man, they're dead, there's just like these blind people and my group got together, we laid hands on them. Dad, they can see now. <laughs> yeah, you can clap, that's God, man. What are we talking about? And he says, Dad, and Daddy gets better. He goes, there's this dude, this old dude, he's walking around with this cane, limping around. And we just came up to him, and we prayed for him, Dad. The guy was throwing away his cane. He was dancing in the streets. <laughs> and then it gets even crazier. He goes, Dad, there's this guy in the middle of the street, and he looked dead. He said, Dad, he was blue, and he wasn't breathing. He says all his friends gathered around him. They dragged him into a room. The doctor said it looks like to toxic alcohol syndrome. And my son, he says for some reason he felt this gravitational pull to get close to this man. And amidst all the people looking at him and a witch doctor chanting in the background, my son says, would you mind if I prayed for this man? And the guy had no idea who my son Luke was. And he goes, go ahead. And my son laid his hands on this guy's legs. He started praying. And after a few moments, the man bolted up and looked at my son with his big eyes. And then he started speaking in different languages. My son says there are like 10 different demons in this guy. My son had never seen stuff like this at Northwood. I mean, he's seen kids that were like demons. <laughs> but he hadn't seen like this type of stuff. So he was changed. My son has never been the same again. And what's really great about my son is that wherever he walks, he has the boldest spirit. My, my daughter recently asked him, last week she called him up, says, Luke, on a scale of one to 10, how happy are you? He said, 11. <laughs> because he's living out the wildness of God. See, you're called for that, man. You're li you're, you're, you have this design in you to roam and fill the whole earth. You're supposed to feel free. You're supposed to feel like you can go anywhere in the world because you got God. You got the Holy Spirit roaming the earth, filling it with the presence of God wherever you go. Without you, you even saying a word, you can bring out the light of God. So yeah, so if you're an introvert, you can be quiet and it's, just, it's gonna start emanating from you as you just love people. The other component to this is really key is the idea of not only roaming, let's say roaming together, roaming, roaming, let's say together, okay? And let's say blessing together, blessing. You're called to roam. This is your destiny and bless the earth. And this is from Genesis 12, okay? What I love about the book of Genesis, and if you study the scriptures, uh, it's really cool. Like in New Testament, you get a lot of didactic literature, especially with Paul. But what's really cool is in, in, in Old Testament, you got uh, these narratives that are rich and meaning and nuance. And in the book of Genesis, you have these motifs that really tell you how to live. And what's great about it, it's not just telling you directly. You just read the story and you get caught up in it. And all these great principles of how to live come out. And so that's what's happening here in Genesis. From chapter one, you get this idea of, man, I'm called to roam the whole earth. God told me I'm made in his image. And then the other piece is Genesis 12, you're called to bless the earth. Okay, bless it. 
And so he says, you know, I've given you a blessing to Abraham said, or to Abraham, to bless the nations. So, you know, being a student, I'm thinking, well, what does blessing mean? Because, you know, when someone sneezes, you say, bless you. Well, what do you mean? Bless you. We just say it without again meaning, an intentional blindness. It's just one of the things we do. Well, blessing, if you study the theology of blessing, it actually has four major components. And I'm going to say it real quickly, and then we're going to break it down. Seeing, knowing, affirming a person's special destiny, and radical generosity. One more time. Seeing, knowing, affirming a person's special destiny, and then radical generosity. Okay, let's start with that first part of seeing. We walk around campus, and you'll walk around the house, and you'll walk around the city like I do in New York. I go to New York every month. We'll walk around, and you can watch it. People don't see each other. In fact, you could be sometimes talking to a fellow student or to a professor, and have you ever seen them as you're talking and engaging in conversation? Their eyes are looking over here, or they're looking over here, and they're not paying attention. See, a lot of times we're seeing people, but we're not really seeing the dancing bear in them. We're not seeing it. We just see the external. We're not trying to really see what's going on. So again, we got our technology even as students, and we bury our heads in the technology. And again, we're not seeing. Did you know part of blessing is actually taking the time to see somebody? That if you really try to pay attention to somebody, that's actually a form of blessing. So when you're there to be fully present, whenever you do that with people who are Christians or not Christians, you are expressing the pleroma, the fullness of God. You are filling the earth. You are being his image, his icon on the earth that represents who he is. It's beautiful. Not only are you called to see people, you're called to know them. And that's the deeper part of it all. It's like, like when you see a person, you got to get to know their story. And so I want to encourage you as you hang out this next year, listen to a person's story. They say, tell me your narrative, man. Like tell me from your, when you were born to today. Tell me all the ups and downs. And tell me like what energizes you, what doesn't energize you. And just ask each other these questions and you'll find your group starts to unite. Because typically our generation, your generation, unites not on strengths, you unite, you unite on pain. Because pain is the thing that connects humanity, not our strengths. In fact, if you embrace pain, it will become your authority. Check it out sometime. The more you're transparent and you reveal some of the junk in your life, you don't have to do it to everybody, but the, in the right settings, the more you do it, you'll find a connection to people. See people, know them, and affirm their special destiny. What's that? Affirm their special destiny is when you look at a person, you get to know them, and you call it out, and you say, man, you have an amazing ability to lead. Man, did you know you're creative? Did you know you have those entrepreneurial, innovative skills? Wow, I can't believe it. Can you imagine if Biola started being that way? I'm sure it already is. But imagine if it, it just became a place where you guys were just calling out how great the people around you are in terms of their, their unique giftedness and creativity. Can you imagine how beautiful that would be? People would want to come here because it's such an encouraging campus. Seeing, knowing, affirming a person's special destiny, and then generous giving. Now, we, you, you kind of know what that is, but, so let me break it down with this illustration of John chapter four. And I'm gonna highlight one verse in verse 29. You know the story, right? The Samaritan woman who's an outcast. Samaritan people were the half-breeds. They were the half-Jew, half-Gentile. Um, for a Jewish person to marry a Samaritan, the historians say it was worse than going to hell for the parents. They couldn't believe it would happen to their kids. So Jesus does a very unique thing. First, he goes not the, the, the short way, he goes the long way, and he goes through Samaria, and he talks to a woman, and she's a Samaritan woman. That's what I love about Jesus. He was always about the fringe. He cared about the outsiders. Hey, by the way, this is just another thing. As you think about strategy for your future and who you should serve, always start with the fringe. The fringe are the gatekeepers to the masses. You reach the marginalized, and then you'll reach, reach the masses. Jesus knew that, so he went for the outcast, the people no one else would go, go after. He went to the Samaritan woman, and he actually starts talking to the Samaritan woman. She can't believe it. Jesus is talking to her. 
And as they engage in conversation, you start talking about water, I'm thirsty. And then she starts start talking about another type of water. She, she's not getting it. And finally she gets it, that he's the living water. And then suddenly Jesus tells her, I'm the water you're looking for. I am the Messiah. And then she goes, what? You're the Messiah? And then suddenly she meets Jesus and she runs back to her village and in verse 29 she says these words that I want you to focus upon this morning because they're essential to what we're called to do as we roam and bless the earth. What does it say in chapter four, verse 29? It says, she ran back to the village and she told, every, she told everybody that Jesus knew everything that she did. So what was that? What are you talking about? You see, what Jesus did is he knew her. He knew her like no man has ever known her before. You with me on this? You see, guys, I looked at her before, and they saw something, but they didn't see what Jesus saw. They were looking at something external. Jesus saw her soul. Don't you realize that's one of the greatest, most divine acts where you represent God on this earth is when you go ahead and you see a person and you call them out and you know them. And what's gonna be great about a lot of you is God's gonna give you unique abilities to see in a person's heart even though they don't say anything. And they're gonna lead people to Jesus. Let me tell you my journey on this because it sounds really crazy. You go, what are you talking about? I mean, you, you can see things without maybe asking them even? Yeah, because you got the Holy Spirit who guides you. He's in you, remember? He's in you, the power's in you. I was uh, in this situation at, uh, at church and this young man came to speak and he, as he was sharing, he came to Dave, I prayed before I came. I'm a, I saw a whole bunch of people coming to the church. I, thousands from around the world and they were getting healed. I go, wait, you don't know our church, man. We don't do that type of kooky stuff, man. I said, no, I don't think so. He goes, no, seriously, I saw all these people coming getting healed. I go, okay. And so he gets in the service and he starts preaching. And as he starts preaching, at the invitation time, his arm starts to get, starts to hurt. And he's, he says, Dave, can you take over? My arm's killing me, I don't know what happened. And I said, okay. And then as he's stepping off the stage and I was stepping on, he goes, oh, I got it. There's somebody here with their arm hurt, and uh, if Dave, if we pray for them, I think they'll get healed. Is that okay? I go, yeah, dude, but remember our church. Uh, you know, nothing kooky or spooky here, man. Keep it cool, because we're not really that charismatic. He goes, okay, okay. And so he goes, okay, does anybody have a problem with their um, you know, right arm? Raise your left hand. <laughs> There's a guy in the front row that did that. There's like a 1,000 people in the audience. In the name of Jesus, he just said something simple, nothing crazy. In the name of Jesus, we pray that your arm would be healed. Everybody's watching, like a thousand people. The guy, he goes, wow. He goes, it's gone. He goes, okay, move it around. I'm not trying to manipulate you psychologically or anything. Just move it around. And then he looks at the audience. Again, my people had never seen anything like this. Does anybody else like need healing today? I kid you not over half the congregation flooded forward. And that broke something in our church. So, fast forward. I'm in yogurt land. <laughs> you know what's so cool about this? The owners go to my church, it's perfect. <laughs> I get this little card now from them, it's awesome. And so, I'm at yogurt land, I'm kicking back. And I'm sitting there, this guy comes walking in, this preacher guy that was there that day, this young guy, probably in the late 20s at that time. Again, because of young people, you don't have to wait. Things can happen now. Okay, seriously. Some of you are thinking down the road, hey, it can happen right now, right where you are. Seriously, and it's fun. So school can be fun, really. All right? And so what happens is, you know, I'm sitting there in yogurt land, I'm checking it out, just kicking back, eating my yogurt, pistachio yogurt, cooking, you know, cooking cream, all that stuff. He comes in. He goes, uh, Dave, I've been praying about you. I can't believe you're here. He goes, I think you got like these special gifts. You mind if I pray for you that God would just unleash these gifts in you? I go, all right, dude. Okay, yeah, why not? I need prayer. We all need prayer, sure, why not? 
At this time, Yogurt Land was the hottest place on earth, right? There was like lines going all over the place in Irvine. And so he, he takes me out. I thought he'd take me to this little sp- small private corner. It actually wasn't. It was like right in the middle of the sidewalk where you know, hundreds of people are flooding by us, young adults, college students. And he's just, I'm right, seriously, in the middle of the sidewalk, people are brushing by us. And he starts this, he lays hands on me. He says, dear God, would you bless Dave? Lord, give him the anointing, give him the power. And he's just going off, man, he's going off, right? And he's starting to spit, right? It's just a, it's just, and I'm a germaphobe, so it's getting worse, right? And I'm just thinking about all the people that are watching me, checking me out right now, and I'm thinking, does anybody know me here? This is so embarrassing. <laughs> and I'm standing, and it's now like about minute five, okay? He's still yelling louder. And I'm going, oh, gosh. And right in the middle of my embarrassment, it's like I heard God's voice say, oh, Dave, you're more concerned about what people think than receiving my power. Hey, and Biola, you know what happened at that moment? I just started weeping. I said, God, that's been my whole life. It's all been about pleasing people. And now it's showing up as an older man now. I said, God, forgive me. I don't want to live fearing man anymore. I want to be free of that. I want to be bold and I want to roam the earth. Wherever I am, inside a box or outside of it, I want to be free. Something changed. I'm in the taxi cab. I'm an introvert. You know, it looks like maybe I'm extrovert since I'm up here, but I'm not. I don't usually like people. <laughs> and so uh, I like to be by myself. I talk to myself all the time. You know, I read books and you know, watch videos, so I'm happy by myself. And so I had to go to New York. This limo came, pick me up, and when I go into limos or taxis, I just say, and yeah, I don't talk to them very much. I say hi, and then I'm done. I'm into my book or something. And uh, this time was different. Muhammad came by. This, I didn't know who this limo driver was, and uh, I sat there in the back seat. I felt the prompting of God saying, you need to talk to him. I said, I don't want to. <laughs> you need to talk to him. So I said, okay. So I said, hey, what's your name again? He said, oh, Muhammad. And he's like 55 years old. I go, hey, where are you from, Muhammad? He said, I'm from Iran. I go, oh, okay. So we sat there and we talked. And I said, what do you want me to do, God, with this? And I started praying. And I suddenly got this insight into Muhammad. I saw this image of this brain. And I felt God saying, this guy is a brainiac. He's an academic. And so I said, hey, Muhammad, are you like, like this really intelligent guy? Like, did you go to university or graduate school someplace? He goes, yeah. How did you know? He said, I got like my master's degree in economics in Iran. I go, ah, hmm. I said, Lord, do you have anything else? I go, come on. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm kind of tapping into it, because again, this is all new to me, right? I'm not used to this stuff. And suddenly I saw this image of this very uh, large woman, okay? And I didn't know how to tell him this. <laughs> So again, I'm just kind of straight up. I said, well, hey, is there like a big woman in your life? (laughs) I didn't know how to say it. He goes, yeah, how did you know? (laughs) She's causing me a lot of trouble right now. (laughs) He goes, seriously, what do you know? I go, well, you know, I I, I told him about my Bangkok experience, how I had some spirits experiences, my kids experienced stuff. He goes, oh, and they got really quiet for almost all the way to to LAX from Irvine. And then at the moment, then he's looked at me, and I I, I looked at him, I said, hey, you know what? I think you need to know Jesus, man. He goes, yeah. I go, why don't you pray this prayer, but keep your eyes open. (laughs) And he prayed this prayer that was a beautiful prayer to receive Christ. And he, he says, Dave, I'm about to cry. And he goes, I will never be the same. Thank you. We pulled up right into LAX, and I felt God say, give him everything in your wallet. I said, no. (laughs) I just went to the ATM. I'm going to New York City. I had a lot of money, and there was a big wad. I said, no. Just give him everything in your wallet. He said, Dave, I know you're trying to argue and justify in your head that this is not me but that's okay, you just need to learn how to give 
away everything. I got out of the car. I was a reluctant giver, not a cheerful one. I pulled out my wallet. I said, here, God told me to give you this. <laughs> the guy acted like I had leprosy. He ran away from me. And he, and he got to the other side of the car. He said, sir, I cannot do that for you have given me something better than money. Listen, you're amazing. Do you realize that? Do you realize how beautiful you are? You are made in the image of God. And do you realize the power that's welling up in you is the Holy Spirit? And he's called you not to feel bound today, no matter what addiction, what struggle you're going through, you're called to be free. You can live this out, no matter where you are right now, and I'd love to pray for you. I know right now you gotta be dismissed in a moment, but I'm gonna invite you, if you don't have to be dismissed, I wanna invite you to come right up here, right now, if you want a prayer, just a blessing on your life, just make your way out of the seats. After I pray, I wanna invite you to come right up here, or if you have to leave, then leave. But if you like prayer, I want you to gather right around the stage right here. Just for, it's not gonna be a long prayer. I feel like we just need to pray for you that God will release you and unleash you into a powerful life of roaming and blessing the earth. So let's all stand. If you want to come, you come right up here. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.